Let's go to Hebrews 11. And uh, I had originally planned to be done with the Hall of Faith by the end of June. And you can see how that plan went. Um, we're probably not going to get through it next week either, or maybe even the week after. We are, not, we are moving on from that song, but um, that's just because I don't want you to get bored. But I am, here's what I am doing, and I want you to do this with me. We did this at the very beginning of the study because we knew it was going to be lengthy, and we knew that it was going to require some effort and some time. And so we're going to trust the Holy Spirit to captivate our imagination and our minds and our hearts as we study this together. Because as we, we're familiar with these things, if you've been in church for any time, and even if you're not, you probably have some idea about who these people maybe are. But I, I want you to understand the, the connection that we have with these Old Testament heroes and faith. And, and last week, we started with verse 23 in Hebrews 11 and defined the fifth consequence of genuine faith in Christ and, and that it, it forsakes the world for him. That it says goodbye to the world. And we interpret our text that way, and I know we have yet to read it again, but we, in, we, safe, we can do that safely, like with good hermeneutics, good rules for our biblical interpretation because throughout Scripture, Egypt is a symbol or a picture of the world. And we went to some lengths to establish that. We, we know that very clearly from Israel in the Exodus, that, that they went down into Egypt during a famine, and they sojourned there for over four centuries, and then God brought them out. God called them out. God redeemed them from the house of bondage. And that's how Exodus 20 begins when God gives them the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of bondage, out of Egypt. And once delivered from the world, quote unquote, they could never go back. And they were never to return there. Not for help, not for any reason. And so by faith then, according to our text now, we are to have the same kind of relationship with the world. We know from 1 John 2, 15 that we're not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world, that is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life because they are not from the Father, that they comprise the spirit of the age. They are the world. And so by faith in Jesus Christ, we are called to leave that behind. Moses and his parents are examples of this. And as I said a moment ago, we looked at verse 23 last week with this application. Faith has the courage to stand against, to rebel against, to reject the world's demands. And now let me invite you to look back with me at the text, and we're going to read down through verse 28, okay? By faith, Moses, when he was born, talking about Moses' faith, but incidentally, verse 23 is talking about the faith of Moses' parents, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Faith has the courage to stand against the demands of the world. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. And so thinking back to what we talked about last week, faith has the courage, verse 23, to stand against the world's demands. Moses' parents refused to do what culture and government in their day demanded they do with their children. That they rebelled against the king's edict, and their faith to do that kept their son safe. It preserved his life. And, and that's important because faith created a sanctuary at home for their son and their other children too. Let's not forget Miriam and Aaron. But faith created a sanctuary at home in a culture that sought their 
demise. By faith, they rested in God's purpose for their son. Their faith became so foundational for him, it helped him understand who he was later on in life. We're going to talk more about that today. And it helped him understand his place in the world around him. That's what faith does. By definition, faith is the lens through which we interpret our circumstances and the world around us. And Moses' parents established a foundation for Moses, a foundation of faith that would influence him for the rest of his life. Now, let me remind you of the application we made last week because I know culture is vastly different and that our circumstances are vastly different than what Moses experienced in Egypt. But the same spirit of the age is alive and well. Can we agree on that much at least? And the world still demands our children that we sacrifice them on all kinds of different altars, not just throwing them into the Nile or causing them to pass through the fires, but they still demand our children. And so here's how faith becomes so important for you and me, that, that faith is a shield that quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. Paul talked about that in Ephesians 6, that we take up the shield of faith through which we quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And that our faith as parents, and even as individuals, can God is so gracious in all of that, can be a, a shield that protects those who we love and those who we have influence over. And the way we live out our faith at home, genuine faith lived out at home, protects our children from a world that is trying to devour them. We know that. It provides them with viable answers to those existential questions about who they are and their place in this world. And if we don't tell them, if we don't let faith inform them, guess who will? The spirit of the age. And we see the fruit of that all around us if we're paying attention. So faith is so important because it will help children it will help your spouse it will help you discern your place in the world it will help you interpret your circumstances in your life and by faith we have the courage then to stand apart and to live differently that we don't have to go with the flow we don't have to do what everybody else is doing we don't have to obey the demands of the world because we are new creations in christ and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world amen now, we can turn our attention back to verses 24 through 28 where Moses remains our example. And he follows in his biological parents' footsteps. And I call them his biological parents' footsteps because there is a distinction there. He's adopted into Pharaoh's household. He becomes the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, and, but he does not follow in his adoptive parents' footsteps. He follows in his biological parents' footsteps. And the determination there is faith. And, and so when he's grown up, when he becomes a man, incidentally, when he turns 40, he acts in faith. And what he does in faith shows us our second application from our text. And that is that faith has the conviction to reject the world's desires. The spirit of the age so infects us that our desires oftentimes are more closely related to what is going on around us than the faith that we claim to have in Jesus Christ. Faith has the conviction, we learn this from Moses, to reject the pressure the world places upon us to desire the same things. Look back with me at the text, specifically at verse 24, because Moses has faith that forsakes the world's position. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He is rejecting the position his adoption into Pharaoh's family afforded him. And that's what the world promises through position, that you, through this honor and through this place in society. You have power and dignity and prestige. And in, in the world, position means everything. And that's why we are told that we have to get the right job and we have to live in the right house and 
We have to follow the right career path. And if you're born into the right family, then you're born into a place of position, whether you're worthy of such a thing or not. And, and, and all, of the, all of the things in the world, and I'm not against education because I'm educated, but, but so much is promised by way of position through education that if you just get the right degree, if you just have the right education, that that comes with the expectation of being placed in the right position or fame, whether you're an athlete or an entertainer, that comes with the expectation of position or political power. I mean, you can, you can control people's lives if you just get the right position of political power. They, it all comes with the expectation of position. And the point I'm trying to make is this. Moses had all of those things. He had all of those things. He was adopted into the right family. He had political power. Right? Can we see those two things? That he had everything uh, that, that Egypt offered him by way of education. So he just spent those few years with his biological parents before he was brought back to Pharaoh's daughter. And, and once adopted into Pharaoh's family, he would have had all of the education that that position could have afforded him. That he had the right career as a prince of Egypt. That nothing was outside of his grasp. He had all of those things. And he turned his back on all of them. By faith. It's important that, that we understand this. Stephen even points this out. Stephen in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7 and verse 22 says that Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians and he was a man of power and words and deeds and so life could not have been any easier for him. He could have conditioned, uh, continued in that position of rank and honor among the Egyptians. He could have tried to be a second Joseph in that regard. You know, second highest ruler in the land. God could have used that perhaps to redeem his people. But as he became a man, as he grew up, the scriptures say, and when he was 40 years old, two persistent realities could not escape him. That there were two nagging truths that he could not set aside in spite of all of his position. He remembered where he came from, right? And he knew who he really was. He knew he wasn't an Egyptian. He knew he was a Hebrew. He knew who his real parents were, right? Thanks, mom and dad. Thanks for the foundation of faith, mom and dad, right? And so those two persistent realities would not let him go. And once again, we turn our attention to Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, this time in verse 23, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, because he knew who he was and because he knew where he came from. He could not turn his back on his people. And so he acted in faith. When we connect the dots, what we're told here in Hebrews eleven twenty four by the Holy Spirit, it was then that he refused to be called the son of of Pharaoh's daughter. It was then that he turned his back on his position, all of the prestige as a prince of Egypt, all of the power he had at his disposal. He renounced all of it and decided to cast his lot with the covenant people of God. And, and I want you to notice something. There is an undercurrent in this text here that, that Moses is making calculated decisions here. That he's considering this. He's deciding. He's choosing. And, and oftentimes that's what faith looks like for you and me. Especially when it comes to our relationship with the world. By faith we simply choose different things. That it's not some mystical thing that we are, we're operating on a hunch or, or a gut feeling. That's not faith. Faith when it comes to our relationship with the world is deciding to do different things. And that's what Moses does here, his refusal to remain as he was, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, came through deliberate consideration, not hot-headed enthusiasm. There would be times when, when Moses would allow his emotions to drive the bus, and when he went out and visited his people, he thought in that moment that he could maybe deliver them, so he reacts, and he slays the Egyptian taskmaster, and that's, that's letting your emotions drive the bus, but this decision to renounce his position is not a reaction. It's calculated. 
It's not sentimentality. He's not giving in to his feelings here. Either he spent time weighing the eternal value of the things that were offered to him as a son of Pharaoh's daughter or as a covenant child of God. And by faith, he went with what he deemed most valuable. By faith, he chose the people of God. Loved ones, that's what faith does. Faith chooses. The faith weighs what's offered to us from the world by way of position. That if we just have the right, you name it, and all of the position and all of the honor and all of the power and all of the prestige that that might afford, faith looks at that and weighs it and chooses rather to be numbered among the covenant people of God because all of these things that are offered by the world mean precious little compared to Christ. That's what faith does. And so whatever security that position might afford us, might provide, cannot be compared with the peace and the blessing that comes from walking by faith. And so faith chooses then to walk with Christ. By faith, we renounce all of the claims that the world may make, all of the pressures of the world to try to attain to any kind of position and the claims that they make on our hearts. Faith forsakes the world's position. Moses did that by faith. Secondly, in verse 25, faith forsakes the world's pleasure as well. Look there with me at the text. It, by faith, he chose, again, he's making a decision here. By faith, to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith, he makes a choice to forsake all of the pleasure that is offered by the world. And make no mistake, there is pleasure offered by the world. Otherwise, it would have no sway over our hearts. There would be no draw from it. There would be no temptation because of it. There is pleasure in sin. But we know from the text some certain things about that. And when it comes to faith, we're willing to set that aside, to let it go, to forsake it. Verse 25 reveals two very different divergent paths for us. On the one hand, we have all the pleasures offered by the world. And on the other, we have what the text calls mistreatment with the people of God. Maybe a meager existence compared to what is offered by the world. Maybe it's a simple existence rather than the extravagance offered by the world. Maybe it actually is mistreatment and persecution and suffering with the people of God rather than the ease and abundance offered by the world. But those are the two divergent paths here. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea because the text isn't presenting one as more virtuous than the other. Suffering and mistreatment isn't always the best option, isn't those things aren't always good things, right? Sometimes we suffer because we did wrong and we're just reaping what we've sown. That's not a good thing, you know? But if we're suffering for the sake of Christ, Peter helps us understand this in both of his letters, then, then we're blessed. That, that is a good thing. At the same time, we can't say that pleasure is always a bad thing, right? Because there, there are things that God gives to us for our good, that he gladdens our hearts with good food and drink. That, that we, we are joyful when we come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And in that communion, in that fellowship, that there is joy. And, and those are good things. And so pleasure isn't always a bad thing either. However, as I hinted at a moment ago, there are two clear characteristics of the pleasure that are offered by the world that hangs us up clearly become wrong because they're temporary. They're fleeting. And, and by that, I mean they simply will not last. And, and it doesn't matter if you get to enjoy them until your last breath. When you die, they're over. Read the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in the Gospel of Luke to understand that the, the rich man lived in luxury and feasted every day, but when he died... 
He lifted up his eyes in torment and longed for somebody to dip their finger in water and drop a drop of water on his tongue to cool him off. But Lazarus, the poor beggar who sat at his gate when he died, he was ushered into Abraham's bosom, into the very presence of God, where he was comforted. My point in saying that is, you know, it doesn't matter if you enjoy them your entire life. That if you have everything this world has to offer, when you die, they're over. That's it. They're fleeting. They will not last. Which is why Jesus tells us that our lives do not consist of the abundance of our possessions, our pleasures, the things that are offered by the world. And so to choose something that is temporary is a poor choice at best, right? It is a choice that will not last. And second, they can be sinful. They are the fleeting pleasures of sin. And, and here's what I believe the text to me. I believe this is specifically a reference to unbelief, considering the context. The whole chapter is about faith. Moses is making decisions here when he becomes a man to choose to leave behind all of the pleasures of the world and instead choose to be mistreated with the people of God. And I think Moses understood his choice, again, because of that foundational faith imparted to him by his parents. And, and by the way, I think he's weighing that same kind of consideration applies here, that he's, he's weighing and, he, and, he, and he's, he's testing. You know, he's had 40 years to figure it out. He's experienced all of the good the world has to offer. And now he's come to the crucible of his faith and he has to make a decision. And don't you think he knew it would be far more enjoyable for him in the short term to continue where he was? That's where the world hangs us up because we know it. We know it's going to be far more enjoyable. There's far more pleasure to just continue as we are, at least for the short term, at least for as far as we can see. He could have continued to enjoy all of those things. Joseph enjoyed the same pleasures in Egypt, right? And he enjoyed them in the same place. The difference being, Joseph arrived there by faith, right? Joseph got there by faith. God brought him to that place and that time and Joseph walked by faith and believed God and did as God had called him to do in that time and in that place. And so he enjoyed the same pleasures and in the same place. But Moses didn't arrive there by faith. Moses was called to leave there by faith, right? And so if he were to continue, even in the short term, to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, that would have been a sign of disobedient unbelief. And so instead, by faith, he chooses something else. He renounces the pleasures as, at his disposal. And he chooses solidarity with the people of God. What a glorious exchange this is. And it will never make sense in the eyes of the world for you to let the things go like position. Security. But it is a glorious exchange when we exchange all that the world has to offer and we choose instead to walk by faith and not by sight. Now I, want, I want you to understand me because I believe God is calling us to do the same thing in the same way by faith. If our relationship with the world by faith mirrors that that Moses does here in our text, it's not an easy choice in a culture like ours, is it? aren't we just programmed from the time of our birth to take the path of least resistance? To do what brings us joy in the short term and in the immediate? We're not taught how to discipline ourselves, how to delay pleasure, how to choose what's best in the long run, but that's what faith does. We must remember that this world is passing away and so too are its desires, but the one who does the will of God will abide forever. First John 2, 16.
If we're not to love the world and the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, because they're not from the Father, they're from the world, we have to remember that all that is in the world, along with its desires, passing away, are temporary. But if we plant our flag in the ground where faith lands, and we do the will of God when we believe in Jesus Christ, that's what Jesus said is the will of God, right? This is the will of him who sent me that you believe in the only begotten son. We plant our flag in the ground where faith lands. That gets us eternal pleasure because we need to remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 1611, that in his presence, there is joy and pleasure forevermore. What we choose When we forsake the world's pleasure and we choose to walk by faith is something that will last, that can never be taken away from us. It will not diminish with time. Thieves cannot break through and steal. Moth and rust do not corrupt. Those treasures in heaven that are reserved, kept for us by faith, they're ours forevermore. We are choosing what is better over something that might bring us a little bit of pleasure in the short term. Faith forsakes the world's pleasure along with its position. And then thirdly, look with me at verse 26. Faith forsakes the world's prosperity as well. By faith, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. In particular, and specifically, he was looking for his reward. We can assume, based upon his position, right? Son of Pharaoh's daughter, prince of Egypt, a place in the royal court, all of the pleasures that were available to him, there was also a great amount of treasure that belonged to him as well. The treasures of Egypt were at his disposal. You don't have to to go very far to understand what this looks like. You watch any um, history show on the History Channel about Egypt and where where they're digging up another pyramid and they're uncovering another pharaoh's tomb and, and they're buried with vast hordes of treasure. You can go to the Natural History Museum and look at those exhibits and you understand they were a very wealthy people, the wealthiest of their day. He had more resources available to him than anyone else among his countrymen. Moses, again, takes all of this into consideration, that he's weighing it. The treasures of Egypt on one hand, all of this wealth at his fingertips against what God had offered through his place among the covenant people. And in particular here, that idea that he considered the reproach of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt means that he was counting the cost. What is it going to cost me if I stay where I am? And what is it going to cost me if I go with them and I walk by faith? What is it going to cost? And so as he counts the cost, he again decides, he chooses by faith. And what he decides to do is not a wing and a prayer. It's not a Hail Mary. It is well-founded and it is certain that he understood by faith the worst that he would endure for Christ would mean more to him than all of the treasures at his disposal in the world. Now, I want you to consider that with me, if you will. The worst that we can endure for the sake of Christ is more valuable to us than the very best that the world has to offer. Faith chooses this, right? Moses is an example for us of that kind of decision. And and by the way, in case you're just thinking, eh, that's Old Testament stuff. I think God might want something different from me. I want to invite you to consider the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 14, because Jesus tells us to do the very same thing, to consider, to weigh, to count the cost. 
Take inventory of everything that the world has to offer you and then consider it in terms of wealth about what all that is promised to you through the gospel. This is what Jesus says. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 27. Which of you then, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? And so now in parabolic language, he is trying to help us understand, as would be Christ followers, of the decision we must make. We have to choose between him and the world. Everything that the world has to offer has to be counted. And all that he has promised has to be counted. We have to count the cost. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish... All who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. In other words, don't enter into this spuriously or half-heartedly. It is worth the time to count the cost. And by the way, I don't believe Jesus is afraid of you taking the time to count the cost if he invites you to do that. Would you agree? Don't you think he wants you to? Or he goes on to say, what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000, meet him who comes out against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. The same truth is being applied there. Count the cost. Weigh it. The world has considerable resources to offer you, and men is tempting. And Jesus knows that. But it's poverty compared to the wealth that is offered to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we really weigh it and we understand what we are deciding between, this means precious little compared to this. Amen? And that's what Moses does. And that is what faith does, loved ones. Whatever gain whatever profit, whatever treasure we might have from the world, we count as loss for the sake of Christ. That's what Paul said in Philippians 3, 7. And by the way, he leads into that talking about all of the things that were at his disposal as a Pharisee. All of the best his culture could provide for him, he counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Everything that would have been gain, treasure, profit, was loss. And in verse 8, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Christ is true treasure that will last. This will pass away. Christ will last. He goes on to say, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Can I, can I be crude for a minute? Maybe. You, all of you are really nervous all of a sudden. That word rubbish is not strong enough. Paul's not saying it's, it's trash. He's saying it's dung. And there's a difference between trash and dung. Right? That, that all of the treasure of the world can be flushed down the toilet compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. That's how different they are. That's how disparaging the difference in actual value it, there is. Dung. Treasure. The two cannot be compared. Amen? And so faith rejects the world's prosperity. And that, by the way, leads us into our final application because all of this means precious little if we're not doing it for Christ. Faith forsakes the world for Christ. We learn that in verses 27 and 28 by principle. Paul alludes to that in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. Jesus talks about that in Luke 14. That, that if we just say no to the world, that's no different than asceticism. Do you know what asceticism is? Asceticism is a, a virulent form of self-denial. Like we're more spiritual just because we deny 
the body, any kind of worldly pleasure. And so we don't eat, and it's this austerity, the severity of kind of thing. So we, 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 this monastic practices of the, the first, second, and third century where, where monks would beat themselves, that, that's asceticism. That if, if we're not moving away from the world to Christ, we're just giving away to another form of the spirit of the age. And we're just denying ourselves, and there's no value in just simply denying yourself. Right? You understand that, don't you? There's no denial, and you just simply denying, no, no value, and you simply just denying yourself, no value. We have to move away from the world to Christ for it to matter. That it is an act of faith. That we are setting this aside, even rejecting it, and we instead are choosing by faith to follow Christ. And we learn that from verses 27 and 28. Because in all of this pressure that Moses felt to keep his position, to to choose the easy path and just enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for that season, to, to, to continue to grasp at the treasure that was offered him by his position and rank in the world, among all of that pressure is fear. And you know what I'm talking about because we face the same things, maybe not to the same degree. We're all afraid. If we really act on faith, what might happen? What, pe- what are people gonna think if I do what God is asking me to do? What are people gonna think of me if I, if I say what God wants me to say? How, how are people gonna view my decisions to live differently, to live simply, to live apart? even to say no to the world. It's the same kind of fear. Moses experienced that in the same way and and, and then some. We know he was afraid of the king because when he took matters into his own hands and he slayed that Egyptian taskmaster and buried him in the sand and his sin was found out, he turned tail and ran. He was afraid because his life was on the line. But he didn't, according to our text... Give in to fear. And there's an important distinction here. Because I think sometimes you and I convince ourselves that if we're going to walk by faith, we're never going to be afraid. And that's not what we see here. We see faith operating in fear. That's where faith operates. It's not the absence of fear. And it's not the change of circumstances to get rid of the thing that's causing fear. Faith drives the bus not fear. And and this is so important for us because when Moses' life was on the line and he fled Egypt, according to our text in Hebrews, he did so by faith, not fear. And he endured in faith. We're talking about a 40-year interlude here. He endured by faith because he had his eyes On Christ, he saw him who was invisible. And so he never allowed his circumstances to get the best of him, even though his circumstances took a drastic turn for the worse, right? That he kept his eyes on Christ and endured by faith. And so he was a shepherd for 40 years in the land of Midian. And then God called, spoke to Moses out of a burning bush, Moses listened because he never took his eyes off Christ. The episode at the burning bush is not a one-off. That just didn't happen and come out of left field. Moses endured for 40 years in the wilderness as a shepherd, tending sheep that were not his own because he never took his eyes off Christ. That he left Egypt by faith and he endured by faith. And the same thing could be said when Moses returned to Egypt. That he did so by faith with a message to another Pharaoh. This time he would not just face fear of retribution from the king of Egypt, but also from his own countrymen. You remember what happens? When he goes into Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go so that they can go and worship their God. And Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? I don't know your God. And Pharaoh, then, what does he do? He doubles 
the burdens of the children of Israel. Instead of having to make bricks with straw provided for them by the government, now they have to get their own straw to make the same quota of bricks. They have to do everything themselves. They curse Moses for that, by the way, and so he has to face all that kind of fear too. And, and please work this out with me because this is so important. He has to operate on faith in the midst of all of that pressure to conform to give in again to the world's demands when he goes back to Egypt with a message of deliverance, to give in to the pressure of his own countrymen. Moses, if you had just kept your peace and not said anything, none of this would have ever happened. And so he has to operate on faith. And not only do things get worse for the people of Israel, they also get worse for Egypt because the plagues come. Ten of them. Increasing in severity as God goes to war with the idols of Egypt and topples every single last one of them, finally to topple Pharaoh himself through the death of the firstborn. And in each of those plagues, God would make a distinction between his people and the people of Egypt. The people of Egypt would suffer under the, the heavy hand of God's judgment, but the people of Israel... The more they were afflicted, the more they increased. The more God blessed them until the final plague where they would have to operate by faith. The distinction would only come in the final plague by faith. You remember what happens? God tells Moses that he is going to slay all the firstborn in Egypt. Doesn't matter who they are, if they're rich or poor, if they're in power or not. Doesn't matter if they're an animal or a human being, all the firstborn are going to die. And that is how God would redeem the people of Israel. Pharaoh would finally relent and change his mind and let the people go. Because God would purchase his people through the death of every firstborn in Egypt. God tells Moses some very specific things to do. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. That if they're going to be spared, they're going to have to believe and obey on faith. If they're going to have to take a lamb, and they're going to have to slit its throat, and they're going to have to catch its blood in a basin. And they're, then they're going to have to take that blood that they caught in that basin, and they're going to have to walk outside their house, and they're going to have to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood, and they're going to have to mark the doorposts and the lintels of their house. All in a prefigure of what Christ would do to redeem us out of the world. All in a picture of what Christ would do through his own substitutionary atonement who would purchase our freedom from our sins and from the world. And those that did, right? Those that believed, who did what Moses told them to do at the word of the Lord, would be spared. That the destroyer, the death angel, would pass over them when he saw the blood. That this was an act of faith. And by faith, the distinction comes through the 10th plague. This event would be so significant for the people of Israel that it would liberate them. This would be the straw that breaks the camel's back, if you will. And, and Pharaoh would drive them out. And as they were being driven out of Egypt, they would plunder the Egyptians on their way. And God tells them that this would now become the beginning of months for them. That their calendar, their concept of time as a people group now would revolve around their redemption. That time starts over. History starts over for them because they are a new people having been redeemed out of the world and that they would celebrate it every year this would be marked on their calendar there would be a week-long feast for the passover where they wouldn't eat unleavened bread and on, on at, at midnight on the last day they would slay a lamb and and they would go through this this ornate celebration through the uh, the, the passover and and jesus then takes this event during the last supper in john 13 and applies it to his own death on the cross and the blood of his new and better covenant that he mediates. And the point being, loved ones, by faith it pointed them to Christ. The Holy Spirit, here in Hebrews, helps us understand what they were doing. Moses knew what he was doing. 
Maybe not to the extent that we do now because we have history on our side and we have the written record on our side, but the scripture is very clear. Moses did what he did by faith, seeing him who was invisible, looking to his reward, that he had his eyes on Christ the whole time. And loved ones, you you need to understand that any sacrifice you make, anything you give up from the world, means nothing if it is not without faith in Christ. It is, it is asceticism, as I've already said. It is nothing but severity to your own body, and it is of no lasting value to you if you do not leave the world behind and embrace with every fiber of your being the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, loved ones, help us understand how glorious this exchange really is. We are talking about forsaking all that the world has to offer, its position, its pleasure, its prosperity for Christ. And exchanging all of this that will not last for Christ and his reward that can never be taken away from us because we have faith. Amen. We are, we are letting go of things that we can't even keep, if I can reinterpret something that Jim Elliott said. We're letting go of things that we can't even keep in order to lay hold on things that we cannot ever lose. And that's what faith does. Faith that forsakes the world says, I can't keep this anyway. This cannot have my heart. I renounce this and its claims upon me and all of the pressures placed upon me. And I embrace Christ and his reward alone. Whatever good I have comes from him, not from the world. That's what faith does. And so as we wrap this up, And we bow, and and, and just, I invite you to do the same thing that Moses did as you bow for prayer. I want you to consider all of the things that are at your disposal from the world. Whatever position you have, your career path, your neighborhood, maybe it's even your leadership role here at church. Whatever pleasures you're enjoying in the world, right now, whatever things you have at your disposal from the world. And I want you to consider all of that against everything that Christ has promised. Weigh it. And make a choice by faith that those things cannot have your heart. Your heart belongs to Jesus Christ. And so you can let it go, renounce it, say goodbye to it, forsake it, and turn with every fiber of your being and embrace Christ by faith. So let's pray. Father, help us to weigh what we have in this world by faith like Moses did. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to choose Christ over everything that this world has to offer. That we would do as Jesus calls us to do, renounce every claim that the world makes upon our hearts or we cannot be your disciple. That we would let everything go for the sake of Christ. God, give us the faith to do that Right now, I pray in Jesus' name.